Mike, welcome. Hey, good to be here. I'm Phil Wright. Everybody watching knows Michael Rush. This is my dear friend and co-author, Rick Nelson. And uh, I asked Mike a while back if he would be willing to do a, a Zoom live because I knew it would be the nicest quality and that we could have some kind of conversation. And I should look at the camera, some kind of conversation about this book that we've written. So I, I kind of want to start and, and Rick interject anytime and Mike cut me off anytime. Um, I remember when we first finished the book, your family was one of the first people we got a copy to. How was it received by your family? You know, we, we were reading drafts all, all along. So I you had had been talking with you guys about the story, but I mean, my family loved it. <clears throat> you know, it was, I remember we were driving, oh, it was a long drive. I'm not sure we were, yeah, we were coming back from Florida, you know, as we were driving in the car and, you know, everyone just, you know, loved it. It was a, it's a, a, a very captivating story, I think. I appreciate you sharing that. So I'm going to ask Rick. Um, so Rick, I, I want to give just a little bit of background on kind of how the book came together, why we decided to do this process. Not a whole lot, just a okay. little bit. So if you can kind just, of do that, that'd be great. If I, go I will. I'll, right. I'll do this and everybody will see. <laughs> so, I mean, literally it started when my next door neighbor and our bishop handed me a, a book and said, um, I got this great book. I think you would enjoy it. You want to read it? And I said, sure. And it was this big old book about this big and it had a white cover on it. And it said, a remnant shall return. So that be, that precedes the red, book, right? So we call is, it the white album. The white album. So yeah. <laughs> I read that and I, and I went back to my friend, Bob, and I said, this is amazing. And he says, well, my, I mean, I can't take any credit for it, but my nephew wrote this. And I said, I've got to meet him. I've, I've got to meet him. He says, well, as a matter of fact, he's coming out. Uh, and he's uh, making a presentation in Sandy. And so Susan and I went out to that. And, and the, you know, there was 300 people. Anyway, a lot of people in the room. And, and this captivating two-hour and 20-minute presentation with numerous technical problems, by the way. Ah, it's your, it's your fault, Mike. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> A, a computer, a cord that didn't work, a battery that was a problem. It was, it was, uh, of, it was a nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> scratch was trying to keep the, it was trying to keep this thing from coming out. But so then we had a chance to chat for just a minute afterwards. He was, lots of people were there. And then we, we extended, a couple, we exchanged a couple emails. And then in the meantime, I told Phil about the book and about, Michael and says, you know, Phil, you've got to meet him. You got to read this book. And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he always says that. <laughs> well, that's what he said. That's what he did. I said, so. Michael Rush. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea who you were. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the meantime, I had told Michael quite a bit about Phil and maybe more than I should have. And, um, and then, you know, Michael said, I, I'd like, to, I think I'd like to meet this, this, this guy. So I went back to Phil and said, you would you be okay? And a lot of the stuff he talks about in his book is, is aligns with some personal experiences you've had that you really haven't told people about. Um, anyway, um, he said, yeah, okay, I guess. And, and through a set of miracles, we all ended up in a room. And, we, and a lot of people want to remain anonymous or I recognize them right now, but we just had this glorious experience. We spent eight hours together. And at, at the end, you know, we were kind of all looking at each other and, and our publicist, who became our publicist, was there, and and some other great people. And and I'm not really sure how it happened because I think the spirit was so strong. There's just so much going on. There was just this feeling that I, mean, I think I said to Michael, "I wish my kids would read your stuff, but they won't. I, I wish there was a way for us to to tell these really important stories." And Phil was was doing this. He was nodding his head, and and one thing led to another, and we said, well, maybe we can write a book and we'll put it in a, we'll put it in a fiction format, a science fiction format. Um, so we can tell the story kind of, you know, below the radar a little bit. And, 
And that's kind of what happened. But the, I mean, look, the bottom line is, if not for Michael, this would have never happened. And then if not for some other people, some of whom were in this room, this would have never happened. And just miracle after miracle after miracle has this domino effect. And we just have to find a way to let the people of this planet know what's coming in a way that they can wrap their minds around. So they just all completely go bonkers when this crazy stuff starts happening that, well, it's already started, but it's just going to get more intense, more interesting, yeah. et cetera. And we knew about two years ago when we embarked on this project um, that we'd, we'd come across a concept that was pretty new and unique. We, we were blessed in, uh, near the beginning uh, or near the end of the book to find, uh, make a relationship with Brandon Mull, who we interviewed last night, who most of you would know as the author of Fable Haven and Dragon 20, Watch. Dragon Watch 20, number one New York Times bestselling books. And we met Brandon and, and then his wife, Erlin, is a professional editor and she became the editor of the book. But uh, as we were going through the book with him editing it, we were trying to figure out what is the genre? What, what is this? It's, is it sci-fi? But it has a religious undertones. Is it, is it fantasy fiction? No. Is it historical fiction? We could never figure out what the genre is. And to this day, we think we've created a new genre, but I'm not sure what to call it yet. Um, so we knew that we came across something very different and unique. And as Rick said, we wanted to find a way to communicate to the young people Throughout the world, they're leaving Christianity left and right. It's not just our church that is losing people, young people. It's happening all over the world. People are turning away from God. And here, as we read your books, Mike, and, and, and we start remembering things that we learned before, and you bring things out so beautifully and so clearly, we realize we truly are at the end of the end of days. And now is not the time to see our children floundering and falling away from belief in God. So how do we create a story that is riveting enough to entertain a generation that only gives three minutes to a news story? Mm -hmm. they, they only give moments to everything because of this little device and social media. Their, time, their attention span is super short. So what can we do? to reach out to this generation to help them understand there is a God. He's the creator of the universe. And he put his children throughout the universe on planets probably just like ours. But my frustration in the last several years has been this new concept with the UFO community that have completely turned away from their belief in God and are now preaching that thousands of years, beings from other worlds came here and seeded this planet. And through a process of evolution, we finally started walking on two legs and looking like we look now. Oh, and there's no God. Most Protestant religions believe God created this earth and he put children on this earth. They believe he created um, the universe, but they don't accept the idea that he could have put children anywhere else. And I thought, wait a minute. That's pretty arrogant to limit God. What gives you the right to limit his ability? And why would he just put children here when he's created beautiful worlds throughout the universe? We believe that there are children on worlds just like that. So here is our challenge. How do, we, how do we bring these two groups together? How do we bring this massive Christian group together who do believe in a God and this alien group together who don't believe in a God, how do we bring them together and show them that, you know what, you're kind of both right. And I think that's what we've been able to achieve in return from RISA. And, and it's been amazing how we've been able to bring it together and actually start bridging these two groups of people. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to attend a couple of alien conventions, and I will admit I was worried. I was thinking there'd be the silver hats everywhere and a bunch of lunatics, but it wasn't that way at all. Um, but I was able to speak at one of them, and I was probably the only speaker who spoke on Christianity and God and worlds without number, and it was very well received. So I believe that with your help and influence, Mike, we've been able to accomplish something 
that we'd only hoped we could do. Well, uh, hey, hey, you my know wife what? Over the years just gave me that eye. So anyway, <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I, I think I've told you this before, but you know, originally I wanted to do the same thing, and I tried writing a science fiction book about you know all of this and. You know what eventually turned into a remnant shall shall return was my notes for my science fiction book, <laughs> and I couldn't it's get fun. anyone. You got your notes. You gave them to us. <laughs> yeah. It happens yeah. when you give your notes to people. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, that's pro- you know what Rick probably read originally was probably a very rough draft of of some of my notes that I had been working on for this other book, but I couldn't get anyone to be interested in my science fiction book. They only wanted to read my notes. So it's kind of the yeah reverse for me. Well, it's because, and I, I know what I'm about to say, everybody who's watching will agree, you have a gift from God to be able to understand scripture in a way and make it so plain to those who read your books. And it truly is a gift. I've never met anybody who has that kind of gift. And I don't say that to put you on a pedestal, Mike. I say that in sincerity. It's it's truly a gift. And I think anyone who's read your books is grateful that this is how you chose to write, not science fiction. Mm-hmm. You chose to write from the spirit, 100% truth, nonfiction. And, and that has done so much for hundreds of thousands of people around the world. There might be a couple of other planets that have your books too. I mean, but that's that's another thing. <laughs> just, yeah. just the thought. I, I just received a package from a lady in Israel. Uh, not not LDS, but uh, you know she had you know, read you know my my stuff over there in Israel, and you know it was very meaningful to uh, her. She sent me this really cool uh, Christmas ornament. Um, these two star of David's in her uh, mingled. She's a Messianic Jew, and it's got like a nativity in the center of the star. It's just really cool, but it's it's been really fun having people from all over the world reach out to me and just, you know, talk to me about how meaningful it's been to them. Yeah, it, and that's cool. That's the best part of the whole thing is when people can have the reaction you're hoping they'll have, their strength, yeah. their belief in God, and their faith in, in Jesus Christ. And, and you've done that so well. Okay, I'm going to actually get to the questions uh, that we have for you. So I'm going to try and read a couple of these. The first one, anyone who's read the book knows that the main character is a little boy named Connor. It starts out when he's three years old, and book one goes through um, up until the age of 10. So when I refer to Connor, that's the main character of the book. So the first question, Mike. In the book, Connor interacts with people from numerous worlds and cultures. Do you think there is a place for something like this in LDS doctrine? Yeah, I think that of all the religions that I have studied, the LDS doctrine you know, is, is heads and shoulders above anything else as far as you know the vastness of the scope. And not only... Is there a place for it? I mean, we're told that this exists. I mean, you read, you know, just the chapter, you know, or, or the section heading for the book of Moses and the Pearl of Great Price. One of the first things it says is Moses sees um, many inhabited worlds. I mean, that is, you know, right, it's part of our, our doctrine. A lot of people don't think about it very much, but it's, it's clearly there. Um, also in the Pearl of Great Price, regarding this specific uh, question, you know, Enoch is talking to the father. The father is is weeping, and he's shocked by the fact that he is weeping. And Enoch has been lifted up. His whole city has been lifted up. He has an understanding of what the universe is like. And he's shocked that the Lord is weeping because of the wickedness of this earth. And one of the things that he says is, if you could take the earth and break it down to its particles and number all of those particles and millions of other earths like it, I think it's very interesting that he uses earth-like planets as his unit of measure. 
without number. He says, if you could, that's not even the beginning of the number of your creations. And then he goes on to say, and you have taken Zion up to your own bosom. And he says, from all the creations which thou hast made. So to me, that is, you know, scriptural evidence that Enoch's people have been interacting with other beings from innumerable worlds right there in the Pearl of Great Price. So absolutely, I believe that there is a place for that um, in the doctrine. It's, it, it's in black and white. Great, great answer. Great answer. So here's my next question. In the book, Connor sees Israelites in space. I know this sounds goofy because you're thinking little helmets floating around in space, but sorry, it's the way it's written. He says, Israelites in space, is there any reason to believe that God may have removed a portion of the lost 10 tribes from this planet? I know you've uh, never had this question before, so <laughs> take your time. <laughs> you know, if, uh, if you're familiar with anything that, you know, I've... I've written, uh, you know, clearly my belief is that not only is this possible, it is, you know, what has happened. Um, we know that the Lord removed Enoch and all of his city. We just talked about that. He did the same thing for Melchizedek and his people. Um, there are some other... Um, you know, ancient writings that I have read that talk about other groups, that the same thing has happened. And then in the scriptures, there's numerous references that refer to the fact that the Lord will gather Israel in from the utmost reaches of heaven. So, I mean, I don't know in how much depth you want me to get into this, but Absolutely. I think there are so many different scriptures. I'm not just talking one or two or five or ten. I'm saying there are many, many scriptures. So, so um, I don't hold your thought, but something just occurred to me. So you say the utmost reaches or bounds of heaven. Mm -hmm. Is the earth ever referred to as heaven in the scriptures? No. No. But yeah, I mean this this So if this he's is, gathering them from the utmost bounds of heaven, it's not the earth, right? Yeah, they, they when it's talking about the earth, it says earth. Exactly. Know. So it, another thing that comes to mind is, you know, the allegory of the olive tree in Jacob chapter 5, right? Where there's three distinct groups. Um there's the first grafting, the second grafting and the third grafting. And the first grafting is actually just, you know, comprised of two groups, both of which are taken to the worst places imaginable. The first one to the worst place in the vineyard. And, you know, in that, that allegory, the vineyard is the earth. Uh, there's another group that's taken to the best place in the vineyard. So you've got the worst and the best. But then he says, and this other group I've taken to a place that's even worse than the worst place in the vineyard. So think about that. How can you have a place that is worse than the worst place on earth? The only way that can happen is if it's not on earth. And I mean, this was a doctrine that, that sounds weird to us, but Joseph Smith spoke about this, you know, numerous times, you know, on the record. Um, he, he taught that they had been removed you know, from, from the earth. So I, I think that we struggle, the church, you know, as a body struggles with, you know, what, how to view some of these things that are maybe too supernatural to be comfortable with um, in say a gospel doctrine or seminary or institute class. But the fact of the matter is, is everything that we believe in at its fundamental root base is supernatural. We believe 
that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. You know, that is supernatural. The things that he could do, they're all supernatural things. We believe that the church was restored in modern times because an angel resurrected being, which means they're not hanging out in the spirit world, they're on another planet. And that being came here and showed, you know, Joseph Smith, hey, there's a record. You know, this is supernatural stuff. And, you know, we believe this. Um, I mean, Christianity accepts wholeheartedly all of these supernatural things because they happened 2,000 years ago. But God is unchangeable. I mean, if he can split the, the you know, sea in half and have 600,000 plus people walk through on dry ground thousands of years ago, and he can lift cities off of the planet. I mean, what can't he do? And so that's what we need to realize is this is the reality of things. It's not, you know, what we see around us, you know, every day. Reality is much more involved than than that. It's it's much more incredible than you know what our mundane you know perception of new, this Newtonian world that we live in would have us believe. And I think that you know in the coming days we are going to see you know proof and evidence of this and people are going to be slack jawed when they see it because they're not they're simply not prepared for it. And I have come to the realization that the Lord has designed it this way. I mean, think about the Jews, right? I think about this often. Why did the Lord, or why was the Lord, the God of Israel, why was he announced his forerunner was a crazy man in the wilderness who ate bugs and honey and you know wore you know you know animal skins i mean he was not the ideal mouthpiece why did the lord go that route instead of you know using the infrastructure that he had in place why didn't he get some mighty you know teachers in israel to proclaim the messiah in fact, you know, if you went into the synagogues, I mean, they were confused about who Jesus was. And, I mean, clearly God the Father could have done this a different way. But he didn't. He intentionally did it this way. And everyone had to decide for themselves who this man was. And... The fact of the matter is, I mean, there, there's lots of people that do not believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. They believe that, oh, he, he was a good man. He was a, a righteous teacher, but that's it. But Jesus Christ said that he, is, he was the great I am. He said that he was the son of God. He said, before Abraham was, I am, you know. So how could he say things like that and be a good man, you know, if he is not who he said he was, right? Mm -hmm. and, and yet God didn't, I mean, the way that he went about it, people had to rely on the still small voice because the state did not support you know, him. And we think now today, you know, as Christian Christians in general, you know, we look at what the Jews did and we just go, oh, geez, they just didn't get it. But at the same time, we don't get it either. And we are every bit as blind 
today as the Jews were back then. We just don't realize that fact. And, you know, I think that one of the reasons that we are that blind is because we're not prepared to accept that the Lord can do these kinds of incredible things and that he is the God of the universe and not of North America or, you know, the earth. You know, he is, he is far greater than that. And so the things that he can do, you know, go beyond the box that most people have placed him inside of. So, yeah, going back to the original question, yeah, absolutely there is a place for this. And if people can't see that, you know, I'm, I'm shocked that we're reading the same scriptures and you know, we, we can't see the same kinds of, of things. Um, you you so. made the statement of putting God in a box. <clears throat> uh, to me, that's a kind of a profound thought. And it's what I said a couple minutes earlier, how arrogant it is to limit God's ability, putting him in a box, you know, and close it up. And, and you, you talked about how 2000 years ago, people believed he in all these miracles but they don't believe it today. And if the scriptures say God is the same today and yesterday as he was yesterday, why isn't it happening today? So that's, that's, you know, a powerful thought. All right. I want to move on. I know that you have lots to say and we're going to let you talk as long as you want. Here's my next question. Um, in the book, we write about an elite group of Israelite soldiers that trained for the specific mission on earth. Do the scriptures talk about anything like this? Um, well, you know, clearly you've got like the 2000 stripling warriors. I mean, they, I think that's probably what you base that on, you know, right? The 2000 Luzon. I mean, that's very similar to, you know, the Helaman stripling warriors. So, you know, obviously. I just think, I just Kind of one of those ways to kind of slip in some gospel in the middle of an alien book. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, I think it, it might work. I mean, the Lord can do whatever He wants. I mean, and you, He can He doesn't need vast armies to accomplish His work. I mean, think about what Gideon did uh, with three hundred men, where you know when when the the Midianites came against them, and I forget how many of them there were, but it was over a hundred thousand. And I mean, they were defeated by three hundred Israelites. Um, I think of when Abraham, when you know, there was a league of nations that went and conquered Sodom and Gomorrah and carried Lot off, and Abraham said, "Well, I'm going to go get him." And how many, what army did Abraham have? He didn't have an army. He had other converts that followed him to the land of Canaan. Um, and there were about 300 men. And they went against this league of nations and decimated them. I mean, you, I love the story of um, Joan of Arc, if you're... Um, not familiar with that. I mean, it's incredible. Here that you have this 17-year-old girl who's never picked up a weapon in her life. And she says that an angel appears to her and says, Listen, you're going to go and do this, and the Lord is going to use you to liberate France. And so she does it. And they have incredible victories over far superior. Um, uh, English armies that are in fortified positions and they're out in the open and they've got, you know, stripling warrior type uh, victories. So, yeah, absolutely. The, the Lord can, can do whatever he wants to do. And particularly talking about kind of a, an elite fighting force, I believe that when you read in the Doctrine and Covenants, there's this awesome parable in section 101. 
And it's the parable is about how Zion will be redeemed with great power in the last days. And the reason that it needs to be redeemed is because the Lord set up these men in the choicest part of the vineyard and told them, listen, I'm setting you up here, but you need to take care of this place. You need to build up a wall. You need to build up a watchtower and you need to guard it. And they build up the, they plant the trees and they build the wall, but they don't build the watchtower because they start talking about how expensive it's going to be. And, you know, pretty soon, you know, their vineyard is overrun and, you know, it's corrupted beyond their ability to redeem it. And so the Lord says, I am going to call the strength of my house, my warriors, and they are going to come and they are going to redeem Zion. And he talks about, you know, a larger body of them being left behind and not joining them until Zion is redeemed. So, yeah, I I absolutely believe that there are places in the scriptures for, you know, this kind of, you know, these ideas. I mean, they've they've played out before numerous times. What, What you just described is what we've written a huge part of Return from Risa, where we talk about how, um, I'm not sure if we actually ever say, do we say the term the lost tribes? I don't think we do. The lost ones. The lost ones who were taken from earth and they were placed on another planet so they could repent, learn, listen to their prophets for a change and be prepared for the day they would come back to the earth and save the earth, and we even use a scriptural reference that they would come back on the ships of Chittim, and we talk about this piece of land where they are is called Chittim, and they come back with great technology and power and glory and ability to overcome the Antichrist, Stout Horn, as you often refer to him, who has taken over America. And that's a huge concept that we talk about in the book. But the great thing about it, it's based on scripture. It's some of the stuff that you talk about in your books. Yeah, I'm the the fact of the matter is, is when you start reading the scriptures from the people that you know really saw our day and these things play out, those people write in a different way. I mean, John the Revelator writes differently in his revelations where he's talking about this than he does in his other New Testament writings. Isaiah writes very differently than many of the other Old Testament prophets. It, it, Daniel, when he's you know, describing some of these things, and Ezekiel, they use imagery that I think is intentional because the subject that they are discussing is so incredible in nature in its you know at its core that if they just came right out and said it no one would believe it so you know i i think i i think that the when you really start seeing these things and what's going to take place in the last days you know it's it's incredible it's absolutely astounding and this is why when so many of these same prophets talk about you know kings shutting their mouths and being shocked at what transpires you know the kings are supposed to be the have they're at the pinnacle of the intelligence webs, right? And yet they were dumbfounded by what happens in the last days. Other scriptures say the wisdom of the wise will perish, <clears throat> meaning the people that were the most learned about these things didn't see it coming. <clears throat> the most learned people in the days of the Jews, did they see Christ for who he was? I mean, it's, there, there's these patterns that repeat you know, and it's it's very it's very interesting. Hey, Michael, I'm curious. I, I never asked you this question, not to put you on the spot, but 
I was 13 during the Six Day War. And I was captivated by that. So just, we do address this in the book briefly. And we, and we put these, you know, some of these 10 tribes or tribers in the middle of that, not necessarily because they were actually in the middle of it. We don't really know that. We just know that there was incredible supernatural things that happened. And I did extensive research. And one of the most interesting things we found was that they that they had taken they'd retaken the Temple Mount, and there was only three people that survived of the of the Israeli army that were there. And the next morning, the a whole company of Jordanian soldiers, well equipped, well armed, was about to take it back. And they had just a half a dozen rounds between them. They had no chance. And they and these Jordan these Jordanian troops rush up to take them out. They stand up, they fire off their half a dozen rounds, and the Jordanians drop their weapons, and they run. So that was a story that I'd heard of when I was a 13-year-old kid. Well, in the research, it turns out that there, was a, that there was a reporter from Great Britain that researched the story, and he found one of the three Isra Israelites that survived, and he found someone that was in the Jordanian army. And he put them together for at the same table and said, so what happened? And the, the Israelite was, was first and he says, we thought we were going to be killed and we were waiting to be overrun. And all of a sudden these people turn around and leave. And the Jordanian said, you don't know what happened? And he says, no. He says, well, an image of Abraham was behind you and he told us to leave. So we did. So anyway, you've got that. You've got these amazing stories about these precision airstrikes, uh, aircraft batteries not working on the on the Arab side. It was just remarkable. Um, so can I put you on the spot a little bit, Michael, for your thoughts on that particular thing? Well, I, yeah, I, I agree. I think that the Six Day War. I mean, the whole creation of the state of Israel is just. An incredible miracle. You know, the book O Jerusalem. I read that as a as a kid and was just fascinated by how. I mean, the the British didn't let the Israelis have weapons, and they thought, "Hey, we're going to pull out, and they're going to be wiped out." But they and they were glad. They, <laughs> yeah. they wanted that to happen. I, they wanted them wiped out. Yeah. But I mean, they they survived it and they survived it in miraculous ways and to me it is so clear that the hand of god was involved in the preservation of the state of israel every bit as much as he was in the preservation of the fledgling american experiment when they were going to war against the most powerful uh, nation on earth as well um and you look at that and you ask yourself, what was the role that we as Latter-day Saints played in the restoration of the Jewish state? None. The Lord did that by himself. Um, we, the Tenth Article of Faith tells us we believe in the literal gathering of Israel. We all are very aware of that. But then it says, and in the restoration of the lost 10 tribes. The restoration of Israel, the Lord's got that one. That's not us. Just like the Lord had the preservation of the Jewish state, he can do his own work. And it's miraculous and shocking and inspiring when he does it. So... When the prophet says that we're going to see the greatest miracles that the world has ever seen, he's talking about this stuff. We're going to see things like this. And it's very interesting to me how the prophet, I mean, he says so many things that if you are paying attention, you know what he's talking about. But I'm always very interested that it he doesn't take it further. You know, like when... He, his, his incredible talk on uh, priesthood power. 
where he says, in a coming day, only those that have paid the price to obtain priesthood power will be able to perform the miracles necessary to save themselves and their families. But he doesn't go on to say, and this is why that's the case. He just says that. Then he goes and says things like, in the coming day, if you do not have the constant guiding influence of the Holy Ghost, you will not survive. He doesn't explain why. Um, he goes and invites the entire church. I want you to study the covenants the Lord has made with the house of Israel and look for their fulfillment in your life. And if you do this, you will be amazed. He didn't go on and expound what those covenants were. Um, there's all of these invitations, just like the miracles. He didn't go on and say what the context of those miracles were. So it's like the Lord is using him to point in a certain direction for those that will listen to what he says. But if they don't, we will be exactly like the Jews were 2,000 years ago. In the book, we allude to the fact that the Antichrist may in fact be from another world. And he will come here with great technology disguised as power. And he will have this display of power using his technology. And then he will try and convince the masses, oh, Jesus, he, he's like me. We're from the same place. Oh, by the way, he's not coming back. I'm here. I'm the one who's going to save you. We, we kind of allude to that in return from Rice, so that people can be prepared for whoever the Antichrist happens to be, whether he's an alien from another planet or whether he's just some odd-looking weird guy because the scripture says he has eyes like a human or like a man. What does that mean? But to prepare people that this man will be a great counterfeiter with incredible technology disguised as spiritual or heavenly power. And so my question was, when that event happens, how many believers are suddenly going to say, we've been deceived. There is yeah. no Jesus. There is no God. It's been aliens all along. Yeah. I think that, you know, one of the first things that the Antichrist does, according to, you know, Revelation chapter 17 is he comes in and he wipes out the whore of Babylon, which has been deceiving the nations. This will ingratiate him in the eyes of the world. I mean, so many people know that something is wrong right now. And, you know, they, they want people to be held accountable and nothing is happening. And people are frustrated with, with this. Imagine if somebody, you know, under this, you know, scenario that you described comes and wipes the whore of Babylon out. And the scriptures say he does it in an hour, meaning he comes in and cleans house and it's over. And then I think he's going to take it further because like it or not, every religion on the planet has dirty laundry. I mean, you have... With the Catholic Church, you've had all of this terrible, you know, abuse that's happened. I mean, we may not even know the half of that. What if he comes out and exposes a lot more of that kind of thing? And, you know, there, there's been a, abuse by church leaders of people under their authority, you know, since the world began. Um, that is a sad fact, I mean, Joseph Smith, you know, said, we've seen that once someone gets a little bit of authority, they tend to abuse it. And he was talking about, you know, the church. So, I mean, this guy could, could come and he could shine the light on all of the cockroaches, you know, and paint everything in the same, with the same brush, say, listen, look at your world. All of your wars, they're about your God. They're about your religion. You know, look at what these guys really are doing. I mean, you're being deceived and he's going to come as a, as a liberator. 
And I think he's, I mean, people are going to swallow that hook, line, and sinker. So Satan is a master counterfeiter of all things. You know, so <clears throat> anything that the Lord does, the sa- Satan has some sort of answer for it. I mean, just think about, you know, Moses in the, the court of Pharaoh. I mean, the magicians there, they replicated, you know, some of the things that Moses uh, was doing. They were counterfeits. Um, and it's those counterfeits that are going to be off the charts. I mean, these are going to be incredible signs and wonders that men are performing. Men that say that they are God, you know, and where is where's the answer for this? And I mean, the things, the scriptures that talk about this guy say that he utters incredible blasphemies against the most high God. I mean, he changes time and laws. I mean, everything you think you know, you realize, holy cow, they were lying to us. I mean, this isn't, this isn't you know, what happened. What he's talking about, it, you know, every, the world gets turned upside down. And so unless you really know what the still small voice sounds like in that day, you're going to believe this guy because of what he can do, who he is, yeah. um, you know, and it, it's, it's going to be unbelievable. And it's going to be a, an incredible sifting event that takes yeah. place in a very short period of time. And this is exactly why the Lord allows it to happen because the world needs to be sifted at an incredible level. Um because anyone who makes it into the millennium is going to make it. I mean, just think about the little mini millennium, you know, the 200 year period in, you know, America when the Nephites, when Christ came, anyone who was there, not a single soul was lost. It will be the same way for people that make it into the millennium. So, I mean, <clears throat> there is going to be a tremendous sifting and it's going to take place in a way that people are not prepared for. They're simply, it's not on their radar. And to me, it is obvious that the Lord intends this to be an incredible trial of faith. Just like he intended the Lord's first coming to be a trial of faith. He wasn't interested in making this easy for Israel. That that wasn't if he if that was what he wanted to do, he could have done things much differently than calling a wild man, you know, to be the forerunner of Christ. Mm-hmm. Only about two percent of Israel followed Christ. I mean, how efficient was that? The Lord wasn't interested in making this easy, and He is not interested in that in the last days. He is interested in finding out who we are. What will we do in those circumstances? And, you know, so it, we will go through incredible circumstances before the restoration of Israel. The, The Lord said, even the very elect according to the covenant can be deceived by this guy. Okay, we have quite a few questions. I'm gonna ask people here if they have some questions. Uh, first, while I'm kind of going through these questions, is there a question over here? When we talk about the Antichrist and the miracles that are going to be performed, we talk about it in a really um, opaque way. But we have to think about some of the things that will really deceive. They're talking about these light beds that will heal people. And, and I don't know if that's bad or good. Maybe it's a wonderful thing. But I'm saying the, you're, you're sick and then you're well because you get in a bed that the Antichrist gives you. I want to put something tangible on that. Why people would be so deceived. People who are really downtrodden, mental illness, the, the, the hardships of the world, this horrible underbelly that is so awful. I'm actually really looking forward to that part. Get rid of them. Right? Well, Bobby, did you have a comment on that? Well, um, he asked for 
you know, some specific, you know, miracles or things that the Antichrist is going to do. I mean, we know of a couple that are called out. We know that, for instance, he is going to call fire to descend down from the heavens and in the sight of all people. So, I mean, that's going to be kind of um, a priest of Baal kind of moment, right? Where, you know, the pillar of fire came down and devoured, you know, the, the priest of Baal. Um, that's a pretty incredible miracle. Another thing that um, John says that this guy specifically does, which is mind boggling, is that he gives life to an image of the beast. Um, I mean, giving life to something is the purview of God, right? So, I mean, if this guy does anything remotely like this, we have no answer for it. It is truly magical. Um, another Daniel says that this guy will forecast his devices against the nations and no one's got an answer to it. So, I mean, he, <laughs> I get people writing to me all the time, you know, saying, oh, you know, the Antichrist is Elon Musk or the, the Antichrist <laughs> is, you know, uh, this guy or that guy. It's like, oh, friend, yeah, you've got no idea. I mean, who do you know that can do these kinds of things? You know, it's, we're talking, and this is one of the reasons that he changes the world because he's not some David Koresh guy who convinces a couple handfuls of people to drink his Kool-Aid. This is, you know, someone who people, I mean, he's going to make the most in intellectual C.S. Lewis type person seem like an utter idiot because he's going to have all of this evidence and all we're going to have is the feeling in our heart. So it's going to be a very trying period of time. So, Michael, I was thinking about um, when Rick said he first heard you speak, it was in Sandy. Sandy, Utah. And Rick said a few hundred. Susie said probably not a few hundred. And I, I just realized I know an event where you spoke at where there were nearly 800 people. And you gave one of the most spectacular presentations you've ever given. Do you know where that event was, Mike? Mm -hmm. uh, the was it Leighton Christian Academy? Is that what oh, it was? Yeah, called? that's the location. But what was the event? <laughs> oh, that was your book launch. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I had to pull that one out again. Yeah. <laughs> it was. It was our book launch back in March. I want to kind of go back to the book just a little bit. Did, is there other questions here before we? Can I just ask a question along those lines? Yes. I want to ask Michael, what was it from the initial conversations? That made him interested in even working with you guys on developing this book. What was intriguing enough for him to say to fly to Utah and talk to you guys for a while? Yeah, well, you know, so I, I have had, you know, some really interesting people reach out to me um, over the last, you know, several years. And that you seems know, so hard to believe, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I mean, some of these people have some incredible stories to tell. Um, and so, yeah, I was, you know, contacted uh, in this particular case. Um, it was my uncle <clears throat> who um, said, hey, I, you're there's this guy and he has some very interesting experiences that um, I think you might want to hear. And I said, well, yeah, well, what do you mean? What, what kinds of experiences are you talking about? 
And, you know, he gave me some insight into, you know, those experiences. And I said, okay, yeah, I, I want to come out and listen to this guy. So, you know, we were all, you know, there and some other folks, as you alluded to, and I don't know what I was expecting, you know, out of that meeting. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I thought maybe we'd meet and chat for, you know, an hour. I don't know, Rick, how long were we there? Eight, eight hours. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, I, I mean, the experiences that were being shared were, you know, phenomenal. <clears throat> and, you know, it's just like it, my eyes have been opened from my own books. <laughs> you know, um, when I, 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 I never, I was one of those people. I, I had a friend growing up and, and th this guy was an incredibly intelligent, you know, person. I mean, he was, you know, two grades ahead of his age and um, kind of didn't fit in with, you know, his class. But he told me, he came up to me and said, Mike, you will not believe what happened to me last night. I said, well, what? What happened to you? He said, I was driving home. It was late, probably at about 12 o'clock at night. And I see this light, you know, up over the mountains. And it came fast as lightning and stopped right above my Jeep. And my car stops in the middle of the road. And I'm looking up and there's this big flying saucer just right above me. And, you know, I said, yeah, you're right. I don't believe you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just, I didn't have a place for anything like that. I mean, what, where does that fit in? I mean, I didn't know where that fit in. And then I, you know, when I started really studying this, I came to the absolute conclusion that this stuff has to be happening. And so that's why I was very interested in this, this person's, you know, experiences that they were, were sharing because I mean, they, they had amazing experiences. Well, we do appreciate you coming out to the book launch that that was a fun event. I know that there are a few people here in the audience that actually attended and, and it was such a spectacular opportunity to get so many like minded people together in the same room. And it was actually quite a spiritual experience, I believe. Uh, most of it, there are a couple of goofy parts. That's my fault. But, but overall, it was, uh, I think it was a very spiritual experience. Um, and again, we, we really, really appreciate your willingness to talk about a book that is not written by Michael Rush about uh, based on uh, his understanding of the scriptures. But I guess we've kind of written your book, Mike, like I said at the beginning, you gave us your notes. And I remember that book, you guys, it was probably this wide and you had to read it like this. And after two paragraphs, your neck hurt so bad, you couldn't read it. <laughs> and I told, I told Rick, the book is too wide. <laughs> I literally said, this book is too wide. I'm having a hard time reading it. So, But when the Red Album came out, that was the winner. It was easier to read. And I think the Red Album actually had several new chapters that were not in the White Album. <laughs> Why did you decide to do that, Mike? Yeah, well, originally, yeah, I, I wrote a Remnant Shall Return back in 2014. Um, and, you know, it was published in ver various iterations. I mean, the first, one of the first, my uncle had one of the, the first, you know, versions of it, which was really, you know, just my thoughts. Um, but there were different iterations and I went with different, you know, um, it's self-published obviously, but I went with different, uh, publishers 
uh, to ultimately to uh, where it's the format that it is now. But originally I had the whole thing online, you know, and I just had the book that you could order if you wanted to have something to write in. And what I think happened is my uncle probably printed it from online and which would have made it super big, possibly. I don't know. Um, but Maybe I had, that's what it was. Nice try, Mike, but I'll accept that. But I had those last chapters that, you know, are in the red book. I had those online too, but they were password protected because I didn't want people reading them if they hadn't read the whole book. So when people read the whole book and then, you know, they asked me for the password, well, I would, you know, make sure that they had read it. I mean, it's very easy to know if someone's read it or not. Um, and then I'd let them read those other chapters. And I mean, those, those other chapters, I mean, they're, they're very interesting. And I didn't want that to overshadow the message of the rest of the book. And you know, the, first, the first version of um, A Remnant Shall Return, I didn't even include Ezra Ziegel in it um, because I didn't want that to overshadow it. And sometimes I wonder if it was a mistake to include Ezra's eagle in it, because that seems to be the only thing anyone ever wants to talk about. And they, they stop there. And when you're talking about the events of the last days, Ezra's eagle is the least of it. Um, I mean, what is about to take place is so much more than that. And, you know, people get stuck in some of those more phenomenal Things and they they miss some of the more substantial, you know, prophecies about the last days. So. Are there any other questions out here in the audience? Yes. So you mentioned that this is a parable based on truth. And I know the two of you have done a ton of research and interviewed a lot of people. And um, but I know there's some core stories, and you've mentioned, Bill, that you had an experience yourself. Yes. Can you share? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, and again, I'm not sure how many of you heard that, but but a, a member of our studio audience um, said that because we call this book a parable based on true events, there must be some true events in it. And mm -hmm. I've mentioned, and I spoke at a conference recently, and I explained or described an experience that I had. And I'll try to take a couple moments and explain this or describe it as quickly as possible. Um, when I was 13, I was living in Sandy Springs, Georgia. And I was a recent convert to the church. And it was a Tuesday night, and we had just been dropped off from a three-day scout camp. And it was also homemaking night. For those of you who remember when... Um, we had three hours and they were separate times and different days. Um, it was a long time ago, but <laughs> so we're dropped off at the church and my mom and about a dozen women are there for a homemaking night. And my friend Terry went with me to the scout camp and he and I are sitting on the front steps of the church. And uh, it was a beautiful night, pitch black. All you could see were stars, no moon. And a couple moments later, Terry pointed and he said, look, what is that? And he pointed to this object about just a bigger than a 50 cent piece. And it had a red light swinging or flowing around it. So we immediately knew that's not an airplane. We also knew it was not a weather balloon. Mm -hmm. And we thought, what is that? And it started getting closer and closer. And I remember Terry was just shaking like and saying, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. And it was so strange because as I'm watching it come closer, I am completely calm. And I look at Terry and I say, it's, it's going to be okay. It's, it's okay. And he looks at me like, are you crazy? It's not okay. And the next thing we know, this thing is hovering directly over the church. Now it's several hundred feet in the air, but it is so massive that it easily takes uh, about a city block. And it was so low, we could see the workmanship of the metallic surface beneath it. And we could see this beautiful red light 
around it. And then it started to go up and up and up and then darted away. And we're looking at each other when we run into the church and we're screaming and yelling, telling these ladies, we just saw a UFO, we just saw a UFO. Now this was 1974. And back then, you didn't talk about things like that. And these ladies said, oh, you silly kids, leave us alone. We're trying to pack up, get out of here, go away. So we leave dejected and we go to the back of the church and we sit on the back steps. Now we're looking into the back parking lot. And again, I'm waiting for my dad and older brother to come pick us up. So Terry and I are lamenting the fact that nobody believes this incredible thing we saw. And a couple moments later, my dad flies into the parking lot, slams on the brakes, and he opens the door and he slowly gets out. But my brother, who's in the front seat, jumps out and starts running towards me as I'm running towards him. And at the same time, we're saying, you won't believe what we just saw. And my brother and dad described the very same object 20 miles away from the church. They were driving this road, middle of nowhere, dark, and they look up and they see this ship and it comes closer. And then it's hovering over the car. My dad gets scared and steps on the gas. You know, you can outrun a UFO if you're in a fast enough car. I hear a Tesla can do it, but anyway. So he steps on the gas and it keeps up with them. Then he hits the brakes and it, it goes back with them. And now he's terrified. My dad didn't believe in UFOs or aliens or any of that. And then eventually it lifts up and it disappears. So as my brother is telling me all of this, my dad just looks like he'd seen, <laughs> I was going to say a ghost, a UFO. <laughs> and he's terrifying. And then as we're having this conversation, it's back. We look up. I don't know, maybe a thousand feet above the church and we see it again and we all look up and I immediately think, I got to tell these women, this is old news. I've already seen this. I run inside the church and now I'm screaming and yelling. I grab my mom and I say, it's back. You've got to come. Finally, we get a dozen of these women to come out of the church. They came out of the back of the church and then this thing started to, to come down lower. And now it was so close, you felt like you could touch it. One of the ladies passed out, rolled in the grass. <laughs> the rest of them, all of us kind of gathered in a group and we're just standing here looking up. And then a couple minutes later, this beautiful bright light, white light came on and a, a column of light slowly came down until it hit the ground and it was around all of us and we're all looking up. And I remember thinking, we must look like a bunch of monkeys to those guys. And this lasted for several minutes, and we just stood there. I don't think we were taken and analyzed or put on a table or anything like that. And then the light slowly went back up, and the, and the, the, the red light changed directions and started spinning the other direction on the ship, and then the ship started going up and then disappeared. Immediately afterwards, my brother and I and Terry and, and my dad are kind of talking about it. These women are silent. They're, they're terrified, they're mortified at what they, and they quickly get in their cars and within minutes, everybody's gone. And I remember thinking, I can hardly wait for Sunday. On Sunday, all of these women are going to be talking about what we all saw. <laughs> so, yeah, someone said, uh, I'm not going to repeat what I just heard. But anyway, so, so we get to church on Sunday. And after all the meetings are over, not one woman said a word, and I was so upset. I pulled my mom aside. I said, Mom, how come none of those ladies said anything about what we all saw? And she looked at me and she said, shh, we don't talk about those things. And I thought, how sad that an experience as spectacular as this, we don't talk about these things, especially those who have the restored gospel in their lives. And here's the other, the very end of the story, to me, the most incredible part. Several years later, that location in Sandy Springs, Georgia, is where we built the first Georgia temple in Atlanta. So is there a correlation? I believe there is. Um, but that was an experience that I had, and many people had it. My brother 
will remember it and he would testify. My mom is still alive. She would tell you the same thing. I don't know how many of these women, they're probably in their 90s, are still alive. I've often wondered how many of them have ever said anything. Mm -hmm. Another comment. One last question from Michael. Is there anything like that in scripture about a circular vehicle with lights on? Did you hear that question, Mike? Yeah. Is there anything in the scriptures about a circular craft with lights around it? And yeah, just go read Ezekiel chapter one. Yeah, you you go through Ezekiel chapter one through chapter eleven. I mean, Ezekiel has seen these wheels descend from the heavens, and he sees when he originally sees them. He says they look like a whirlwind with fire and folding in upon itself. And then they come down to the earth and there's around their rims, they're filled with eyes, Ezekiel says. And four living creatures come out of these things and they have the face of a lion, the face of an ox, face of a uh, eagle and the face of a man. Well, those represent the four standards of the house of Israel. So Ezekiel is freaked out by these things because he says they can move as fast as lightning and that they go so high into the heavens that it's terrible. And anywhere these four living creatures go, the wheels go with them. And so, I mean, what is Ezekiel seeing? What's he talking about? Um, it's, it's very, you know, interesting. There's a lot of similarities between Ezekiel chapter one through Ezekiel chapter 11 and, uh, several of the chapters, you know, the book of revelation chapter four, you see the same creatures de described. Um, it's very interesting stuff. We kind of need to wrap this up. Any well, question, over question over here? here. I'm sorry. Yes. I, wanted to say, I just wanted to say that. When I was a little kid, I remember uh, reading the talk, The Gospel Vision of the Arts by Spencer W. Kimball. Do you remember that talk? I don't. It was, you know, Spencer W. Kimball talked about that someday uh, he talked about great writers, poets, movie makers, musicians, sculptors, artists would would come from from the church and would tell the story of, of, of you know, of Jesus Christ and uh, our church and, and our beliefs and, and system and everything, or the plan of salvation. And I always felt like it, I, I hope to be a part of that or something. But I'll tell you what, I think that prophecy has come true, and you guys are part of this. I think that, that he, he talked about how the world would read these books and would learn about uh, the plan of salvation and, and what's to come and all these things, and that that members of the church would tell these stories in book and print and film and music and, and all these things. And with what Michael has done, I'm the biggest Michael Rush fanboy in the world. I have every book, watch all of his videos. But um, a good friend, my, my best friend growing up is a world-renowned sculptor who has sculpted the NFL Hall of Fame. I've seen it happen. That prophecy is happening. Your book, what Michael Rush has done, The Chosen, being in theaters and and you know, last couple of weekends being in the top five box office, even though they're in a fourth of the theater, and members of the church had a lot to do with the that coming forth. So that's happening right now in the arts. This story is being told uh, through through all these different uh, interpretations. Thank you. That's an awesome awesome uh, observation. Were you going to say something else? It's been an an awesome experience to work with Michael and others that the moles and then others that have asked us not to use their names. It's just, it's been so amazing and we're so grateful. And we see, we've seen so many miracles, just miracle after miracle. After miracle. But Was there another question here? Anybody? Yes. I understand that one of the key subjects you guys interviewed um, had some analysis and interviews done by a very famous individual out of Stanford University. Yes. Is there a chance you could tell that? I'd be happy to. I actually told that story last night, but I'll tell it again. Um, 
many years ago, I met a gentleman named John Krumboltz, who was a professor at Stanford University. And um, he went on to be a world-renowned lecturer, had, is, had written many, many books on different types of psychology and therapy. And several years before he died, he was interviewed by a psychologist who was writing a book called Their Finest Hour. And you can find this book on Amazon. And this was a book written by two therapists for therapists. And somehow I got a copy of this book. I know who reads a book about therapists. I mean, I guess just therapists. But I got a copy of this book and I'm thumbing through it. And I happened to see Professor John Crumbles. And I thought, I remember that guy. I wonder what his finest hour was. So I look at the heading, the chapter heading, and it said, recovering from, I think it said, recovering from alien abduction. And I thought, wow, this is a Stanford professor. Of all of the things he could talk about in his illustrious career, he, he spent an entire chapter being interviewed by these other therapists about interviewing a man in his mid-30s in the early 90s in San Jose, California, who'd had multiple abduction experiences. And as he's being interviewed by these other therapists for this story, they're questioning, why would you choose this? I mean, don't you think maybe the guy wasn't really abducted, that he was abused by a family member or something like that? And John Crumboltz held his ground and said, I believe what he said, and I personally have had experiences. So when I read that, I thought, wow, this is amazing, again, that any university professor would have that much courage to come out and let people know they believe that there are beings from other worlds. And uh, there are many people on this world that are have being, having interactions with them, abduction, sightings, or whatever. So we met, or we know this gentleman referred to as Bill, and his experiences play a huge role in the book. Um, the character of Connor is patterned after him. And we did something else. We wanted to make sure that the character of Connor represented lots of different people. So when someone will say, who is Connor? I'll say, well, I'm Connor. She's Connor. He's Connor. You're Connor. I'm not. And Rick is the only one who's not Connor. He's <laughs> never seen a UFO. He's... But, you know, we've been told by some people here tonight they're going to take us out and show us some UFOs. So, hey, maybe this will be Rick's night. <laughs> but, and Mike, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you also saw a UFO several years ago, right? You have to know what these things look like, right? They're not airplanes. We, my wife and I were maws and paws on this trek experience. We were in the middle of nowhere in Wyoming. And we're sitting around the fire, you know, all the kids. And I brought my astronomy laser. And I see one of these things and I shoot it with the laser. And this thing, I mean, it was probably the size of a pencil eraser. And when I shot it in the laser with the laser, it stopped moving. And then it went and then went back to the size that it was before. And we're all, holy cow. And I shoot it again. <laughs> yeah, three times it did it. And I mean, we've had that. Ha I've had that happen so many times. All I can say is the Lord needed you to write at least four books, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what else to say after hearing that. I'm glad it wasn't a triangle-shaped ship is all I'm going to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We talk about that in a book. Okay, I, I do want to wrap it up. I never told people how long this would take. This has been awesome. So, Mike, last thoughts. How would you recommend Return from Risa if people asked you about this book? What would you say? You know, I think that, you know, it's a, a lot of people, they don't, I mean, reading A Remnant Shall Return isn't an easy read for a lot of people. I mean, the, it's just like, why haven't a lot of people studied Isaiah? It's not an easy read. This, you know, is, you know, 
like a a book that's much easier to understand some of these concepts that you know i i believe that the universe is literally teeming with life and i believe that the earth is a hot spot i mean there there was a recent senate uh, intelligence report where they're saying they're demanding that the pentagon explain why there are such an exponent exponential increase of transmedia crafts entering our you know from space into earth's atmosphere and from our atmosphere into the oceans and you know i mean these things you know they're being talked about more and more so this is happening and the return from risa is based off of you know it's a parable but like you said you know phil it's based off of these people's experiences or at least many of those you know stories are based off of people's experiences that they've seen um and so it's 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 a tool to get people that would never read you know isaiah to conceptualize some of these things and maybe get interested in saying holy cow could something like this be real um um I, I think the answer to that is yes thanks mike mm -hmm. you are amazing um and everybody here thanks you so much for being yeah have a oh oh my wife sean says hi to you and amy by the way <laughs> <laughs> there was a question saying is there a facebook page where people talk about uh michael's books it's not michael's facebook page it's some good friends who created a facebook page called ezra's eagle and many of them are here tonight it's a wonderful place to go to learn more about michael's books and to engage in those conversations and of course, we would encourage you also to go to returnfromrisa.com and learn more about the book, um, become an insider, and you'll get all kinds of additional exciting information about the book. This is a series of five books. If Rick had his way, it would be 15 or 20 books. But I don't know we if- We gotta we'll catch be, up with Brandon. Uh, we gotta catch up with <laughs> Well, I don't know if we'll, if we'll be around 15 or 20 years. Um, but either way, we're doing our best to get more books out, and we're also working on the audio version. So thanks again, Mike. Love you very much. You're yeah, awesome. Thanks for having me. Great.